models uh, okay. 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 Good afternoon, Mr. S. R. Nathan, sixth president of the Republic of Singapore, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, or ISAS, I warmly welcome you to this afternoon's book launch for a research in China, South Asian Perspectives. To start off, it is my pleasure to invite Professor Tan Tai Yong, Director of ISAS, to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you, Professor Tan. It is now our pleasure to invite Mr. S. R. Nathan to deliver his special address. Mr. Nathan, please. Professor Tan Tai Yong, Director of the ISAS, Professor S. D. Modi, Your Excellencies, ISAS delegates, distinguished members of the audience, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely happy to be here with you at the Singapore launch of this important edition of edited volume entitled Resurgent China, South Asian Perspective, published, published by Rutledge and edited by ISAS Professor Tan Tai Yong and Professor Modi. 
China's rise has been received with a mixed feeling of awe, admiration, and anxiety. While China's economic growth and dynamism has amazed everyone, its growing military might and periodic assertion in pursuance of its perceived interests has raised concerns in several capitals around China's neighborhood. How China is viewed in the world today is a subject with which scholars are grappling with. I'm glad that ISAS has provided a platform for researchers in ISAS as well as others in different areas of scholarship to study this particular question. This volume, the first to study how South Asian countries perceive the rise of China, will elucidate the delicate intricacies and relationships as well as concerns and opportunities of individual South Asian nation-states vis-a-vis China. As the studies have shown very clearly, the results of South Asian states, the reactions of South Asian states to the rise of China are varied and driven by different considerations and interests. India stands by a category of itself for having sharply defined positive as well as negative perception for China's rise. Indeed, the trajectory of the Sino-Indian relations will also have an impact on South Asia as a whole. While India views China's growing economic and military might with apprehension and anxiety, its other South Asian neighbors are generally comfortable with the rising China, which they see as a source of economic support as well as a credible counterbalance to India. And among these smaller South Asian states that sees China's rise as a positive development, Pakistan stands out in its perception of China as an all-weather friend. The inclusion of perceptions from the smaller nations of South Asia in this volume therefore provides readers with a more nuanced understanding of China's standing in the South Asian region. The contributors to this volume offer authoritative and insightful analysis on the subject matter. The list includes not only former ministers Syed Javed Bhakmulki of Pakistan and Dr. Iftikhar Ahmad Chaudhary of Bangladesh, both attached to ISAS but also senior diplomats, Yanta Nanapala of, South, of Sri Lanka, Shafi Sami of Bangladesh, and Shambhuram Sinkhada of Nepal, and other internationally recognized scholars knowledgeable on South Asia as well as China. The contributions have critically examined the many domestic factors and, stake and stakeholders including business lobbies, military and intelligence establishments, political parties, and ideological groups which shape the perceptions and policies of the respective countries towards China. The multiple perspective and layered analysis, taking into consideration domestic and regional issues, make this volume a well-rounded and deep study. When India's Vice President Sri Hamid Ansari launched this volume in Delhi last year, it generated a lively, lively debate among Indian scholars and policy makers who gathered to discuss the content of the book. I hope our own panel today will, that, that discusses the book will do an even more lively one. Before I conclude, I would like to say a few words about the interest. Professor Tan and Professor Muni. As a historian, Professor Tan Taeyong provides a useful academic foundation, while Professor Muni's on-hand experiences in the strategic and diplomatic avenues in various countries in South Asia, as well as the academic world of strategic affairs, provides this book with an advantage of 
intellectual range and real-world experience. I thank the editors for their hard work and wish both of them and ISAS every success in this and their future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. May I now invite Professor S. D. Witte, co-editor of A Research in China, South Asian Perspectives, to give us an introduction of the book. Professor Witte, please. Sir. I join Professor Tantai Yong in expressing my gratitude to you. Uh, you have really honored us and we feel privileged uh, for taking all the trouble to come to this launch function. I must also thank uh, the chairman of the ISAS and the director of the ISAS, including the staff which facilitated this project. And uh, on the top of it, the project would not have been complete without a uh, very distinguished group of uh, contributors, uh, former ministers, some of my colleagues who are here, uh, senior diplomats, established scholars, and young researchers. Uh, we, we tried to get uh, contributors from all the South Asian countries, except perhaps Bhutan, where we had to depend upon a Westerner. Uh, because uh, our efforts to mobilize somebody failed. Uh, we also, though we wanted to end plan, could not include contributions on Maldives, Afghanistan, and Myanmar. Myanmar may be under debate whether we should treat uh, Myanmar as a South Asian country or Southeast Asian country. But we tried, and if we could get it, I think that would have provided a very different spectrum of uh, views ranging from Afghanistan to Myanmar on China. Uh, now, the book, uh, I wish uh, Prof. Tan had uh, summarized or given the contents of the book because he did a brilliant job in New Delhi when we had this uh, launch earlier. But it is his order and I, I follow his command. Uh, when we come to the perceptions, the perceptions are often interest-oriented. And they are shaped by experiences and advantages or disadvantages which countries or people derive from each other. Therefore, perceptions are always evolving. They are always changing. Uh, India and China had a wonderful hindi chini bhai bhai perception. And it turned into uh, some of the, uh, at a certain point of time, worst adversaries of each other. Now they are again being Therefore, it, it, it's, it's a process which is uh, not final in any sense. But when it comes to China and South Asia, there are two facts which we must keep it in mind. One is that China is South Asia's new and distant neighbor. Why I say new neighbor? Because South Asian countries have mostly dealt with Tibet until 1950. The real, real time interaction between South Asian societies and China was extremely limited and distant because the hub of the Chinese political, economic, and social life lies far away from, from Tibet or, or from the South Asian, uh, uh, South Asian boundaries. They were divided by the Pamis and the Himalayas. And uh, until Tibet was taken over, the, the Chinese uh, did not get worried about what South Asia may be up to or not up to so far as their periphery is concerned. Uh, there is a vague knowledge between the two societies, civilizations, whatever you call it, and extremely limited engagement, also constrained not only by the, uh, by the mountains, but also by the handicap of language and the differentiation of, of culture. There is no Chinese diaspora as in Southeast Asia, in South Asia. Therefore, the, the regular interaction and formal relations have been very, very, uh, very, very constrained. Uh, why I emphasize this? Because India, on the other hand, 
loom so large, almost at every point of life uh, in South Asia, uh, that comparatively you find lesser the engagement, lesser the points of friction. More the engagement, more the points of friction. Uh, this is a subject which I think would be debated by the panelists. But I just want uh, you to keep it in mind that this is a hard reality under which the Chinese and the South Asian engagement has grown. The second important factor is, from the China's point of view, South Asia is China's farthest. South Asia is located on China's farthest and most vulnerable periphery. Both Xinjiang and, and Tibet are, uh, are the disturbing points of the Chinese decision makers and have remained for a long time. I think before 2008, there was a certain impression created uh, that uh, by material development of Tibet and also by flushing in money and moving populations, perhaps the Tibet issue is resolved. But no way. I think 2008 proved it very, very differently. And because of this vulner sense of vulnerability as to what happens in Tibet, I think China both needs the support and cooperation of South Asian countries. Support because in order to control the restive populations or, or the kind of turbulence which might arise in one way or the other, either in Xinjiang for a very different reason or in Tibet for yet another reason, uh, that regular crossing of the border by the Tibetan population into South Asia has been a real headache. And there are several instances of uh, China persuading, pleading, pressurizing the South Asian countries not to let that happen. Cooperation because uh, all these are landlocked areas of China. And uh, for developing landlocked areas, you need access and, and uh, a way to get out. Uh, uh, compare this with, uh, for instance, when China had to develop Yunnan, they had to depend very heavily on the Indochina countries, Myanmar, Laos, to get an outlet for, for goods, for services, for interaction. For uh, uh, Xinjiang, for instance, or Inner Mongolia, uh, Central Asia is crucial, and China has gone and developed uh, 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 SCO as an organization to see that it happens. There is no such uh, uh, formation so far as South Asia is concerned until recently when China came and became an observer in, in, uh, in SARS. This was an issue which was referred last time uh, that, look, uh, India will have to accommodate. I was about to mention at that time when this discussion was on that it was almost a bartered deal, unspelled out bartered deal, where China accepted India in East Asia, where it was resisting, East Asia summit, where it was resisting for a number of years, and, South, and, and India lowered its resistance to Chinese entry into SARC as an organization, both as observers and also SCO as an organization, uh, both as observers. And at both the places, China is keen to become a full member, at least some of the South Asian countries are keen to make China a full member of the SARC, and India, including Russia, is keen to see if India could become a full member of SCU. Uh, uh, East Asia summit is, is a different thing. Therefore, you see this, that if uh, Tibet and Xinjiang have to develop, they cannot really fully develop without a, a, a very uh, facilitated interaction and engagement with the neighboring areas uh, which are in, in South Asia, the population density apart. Now, the, when we keep these two factors in mind, uh, as uh, President Nathan has been very kind to mention, uh, this book uh, is, uh, explains that the perceptions of the South Asian countries is a mix of admiration and anxiety. Uh, there is an admiration all around, including in India for China. Sometimes we go with the misperception of the uh, media hostile headlines. Uh, for uh, China's economic dynam uh, dynamism, for its manufacturing sector, for agriculture, for the way they are dealing with the financial institutions. Uh, uh, there is, uh, China has also been a source of support, even in terms of trade and investment, for instance. All the South Asian countries have welcomed it. Uh, except India, many of the South, I, and I would say in some ways, even India, 
look towards China as a strategic support. Call early 50s if you want to. Uh, when uh, uh, tremendous pressure from US and the Western <coughs> Alliance and China and India and the Chile, by, by the strategic ground was prepared uh, by mutual support to each other. There are instances where China did not establish diplomatic relations with some of the South Asian countries because India pleaded with China that if you do that, then Americans would get a greater excuse to come and fortify themselves in India's periphery or in South Asia. And China, for at least six to seven years, accepted that proposition, delayed its uh, diplomatic relations with some of the countries uh, in South Asia. So there, there, is a, there is a general acceptance, positive attitude towards China in South Asia. But there is also an anxiety, and anxiety comes out of two main factors, the balance of payment and balance of power. The balance of payment, because the tremendous trade which takes place between China and the South Asian countries is essentially negative from the South Asian point of view. That they uh, import more than they export more, and there is an uneasy sense of dependence, an uneasy sense of this negative trade in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, in India, some of the business practices of dumping, etc., is being resented. And all these countries have very quietly been putting it on the table uh, to the Chinese in uh, official negotiations. The balance of power is a bug which has bitten, of course, the India-China relationship uh, more seriously uh, than other countries, because other countries don't see in China the kind of threat theories which you read in academic journals about Southeast Asia and China does not exist so far as South Asia is concerned. Therefore, these two, at both uh, uh, admiration and anxiety, is mixed in the perceptions of the South Asian countries. If you look at India, it's almost equally strong so far as admiration is concerned and so far as anxiety is concerned. I'm not weighing them. There is no mechanism to weigh whether anxiety is more than admiration. Uh, but in Pakistan, the anxiety is very feeble, but it is there, including in terms of uh, the role of extremists, which China have been cautioning Pakistan several times that it should be controlled. And uh, other South Asian countries, I think there is a strong admiration and somewhat anxiety on economic and other matters. Uh, China has very carefully cultivated the positive aspect of uh, these perceptions by cultivating the constituencies and the stakeholders who create that positive uh, uh, perception. And for nursing these constituencies, it has aid, economic assistance, investments, political support, scholarships, joints, they used everything. And also to remove the negative component, whenever these countries have felt very uncomfortable or, or uneasy vis-a-vis -vis India, because of several points of interaction and pressures, China has come forward to assure these countries that they will support them in, in their security, in their independence, in their national integrity, or whatever. In fact, many a times, it is India's lapses in South Asia which have been cashed upon and, and uh, if not exploited, cultivated uh, by the Chinese to their advantage, and why not? I think any other country would be doing that. I think these are some of the aspects of the book. Uh, uh, hope if and when you get in time, you will get through it, but more of it. Uh, from the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mani. May I now request Mr. Nathan and Professor Khan to join Professor Mani at the front.